joints. Uh, the synovial fluid is the clear liquid in the joint. Uh, the knees have an extra padding called a meniscus or meniscized plural. Uh, the meniscus is a just a thick part of like cartridge that is going to add some cushioning. And of course that makes sense because again, all of our weight of our upper body all comes down right onto our knees. Osseous tissue or bone is type of connective tissue. That's just another way of me saying bone is also called osseous tissue. Uh, so don't get, don't get carried away with that. I just remember, just want to turn for it. Periosteum is a membrane that goes around the bone, helps to keep the blood supply in place. Not protection. A long bone has a straight shaft called a diaphesis. You can see that on that image there with my femur. Um, and then it has two wide ends. And we call the wide ends the epithesis, or singular it's epithesis. Epithesis is singular, epithesis is plural. Now, each of those areas is broken down to other parts, but we're not going to get into that in detail. Um, but I just want you to know the general idea that we have a long bone, there's a straight shaft, and then two rounded ends. In the straight part, we find yellow bone marrow, which is like fat, and the end, we find red bone marrow, which is responsible for making things like red blood cells. Is that where um, you red would, is that where you would, in, um, I don't know how to extract marrow for a bone marrow transplant? Yes. From the right yes, because, because what we're after the uh, right is the cells. progenitor cells of the blood cells. Okay. Uh, we call them hematopoietic pluripotential stem cells. Those are the cells that can become any sort of blood cell that it needs to become. Okay. So those are the ones that we want. Yeah. Uh, the growth plates, or the epiphyseal plates, we already talked about those. That's where growth takes place. Uh, underneath that diagram, ossification is the gradual replacement of cartilage with bone. This is what happens as we're younger. We have cartilage that turns into bone, from solid bone. In our youth, bone formation exceeds bone breakdown. That makes sense because we're growing, so we have to make more bone. As adults, we have a bone breakdown that is equal to the buildup of new bone. Uh, and then in our older years, we start to see more bone getting broken down than is actually replaced. What that means is the bones are going to become thinner. The bones are going to become smaller, they're going to lose mass. Which is why, if these bones here in the vertebral column lose mass, if each of these bones gets a little bit smaller, then what's going to happen to the entire spinal cord? It's going to become shorter, which is why the grandma is shrinking. And we also have ligaments that hold all of these in place, that link these together. And then we have muscle that's attached to tendon that is holding these in place. So all of those things keep the vertebrae in place. The mass, the size of the vertebrae, the intervertebral discs in between, the ligaments that link them together, and the muscles with the tendons that attach to them. What that means is um, when someone is out of alignment, as chiropractors like to say, uh, that would mean that either the muscle had to have been injured or was weakened to cause a shift, or the ligaments had to have torn to cause a shift, or the bone would have had to have lost uh, mass, which would cause them to shift, or the cartilage disc would have had to lose a quality that would cause, them to cause the vertebrae to shift. In any case, doing this is not going to make a difference. Going to a chiropractor, when they do an adjustment, it's not going to heal muscle, it's not going to fix tendon, it's not going to increase bone growth, it's not going to change intervertebral discs. It is how we're going to release endorphins, which yes. feels really good. Yes, it does. But it doesn't fix anything. Yeah, that's why I'm cool right now. Well, in medicine, we like to fix things. And when we they want have, people to suffer. And when that happens, then, then like, how long does it last to, like, until so you step out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not long. So you step outside? For real? For real? How about Well, that's different. Not acupuncture. Are you talking about acupuncture? Or are you talking about injection? Okay. Here's the, here's the thing. When somebody has a slipped disc or a uh, herniated disc or a bulging disc or the radiculopathy, whatever word you want to call it, what is happening is because those muscles that are holding all these in place and become weakened or injured, that causes 
the vertebrae to shift like this, mm. which causes this to bulge out to the side. That's what's indicated here. The nucleus propulsus, the jelly like center, is pushed out to the side. Well, remember the vertebrae protects the spinal cord, right? Yes? The vertebrae protects the spinal cord. So as the spinal cord goes down, there's little branches of nerves that come out in between all the way down, and then they send signals out throughout the body, they bring signals back in. So what is happening is this is bulging up, it's pressing on those nerves, especially the sciatic nerve that runs right down along here, which is why people complain about tingling in their foot or um, pain or something along the leg and the butt. So the problem is that once this goes out and impinges on that area, it creates an inflammatory process. Now what follows inflammation? Edema. Edema, swelling. So even if this goes back into place, now we have inflammation right here, which means now we have swelling right here, which now the swelling is pushing on the nerve. So what we want to do is we want to stop the inflammation, and how do we do that? Anti-inflammatory Anti <coughs> corticosteroids. So that's what gets injected right here, corticosteroids. And they stop the inflammatory process that has happened here. But meanwhile, this has probably moved back into place already, and everything's still like this. But once it gets shifted again, it will bulge out again. So what we want to do is we want to strengthen the muscles here, which is why when somebody has this, the very first thing we recommend is physical therapy. Yeah, that's not right. chiropractor, physical therapy. Because if chiropractor doing this, it's not going to strengthen those muscles. It's not going to fix anything. So the physical therapy actually strengthening those muscles is going to keep those from going like this again. It's going to keep them steady. If that doesn't work, then we go to the corticosteroids to help decrease inflammation. And then the last case scenario is a fusion. You fuse these vertebrae together so they don't move. Literally drill and drill and put a metal um, plate here and screw it in place. And now these are fixed, so they won't move at all. But that means they won't go like this and won't bulge out, but now they won't move at all. But now we're talking surgery. So we call that a uh, cage, a spinal cage. Or uh, a spinal fusion, you'll hear that. Okay. Yes. I have a <clears throat> question. Speaking of surgery, like when there's all ligaments and muscles surrounding your spinal cord and stuff, mm -hmm. and you have to access it for surgery, how do you properly get through the muscle and ligaments? And then, Cut. like, yeah, but. But how do you avoid nerves? And how do you put them properly back together so that they work? Like, well, uh, if you can, you can try to cut through as little muscle as possible, as little of that as possible, so that you don't have to worry about fixing and go around it. Um, but repairs to muscles, like anything else, it's, it's a difficult repair to make, skeletal muscle especially. Um, and there's always going to be enough scar tissue that's going to make it so it's not as operable. The ligaments might be a little bit easier, but if you have to, you go through it. If you don't have to, you go around it, that's all. Mm. And if you're going to be using any sort of uh, products here to fuse any of these uh, together, always make sure you use um, products that come from Milk Creek Medical Supply. Because they're the best. Okay. Well, remember that when I do uh, lumbar surgery. It's also my brother's company. So just give him a plug. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, there are certain cells, bone cells called osteocytes. Uh, here are some examples. Osteoblasts build up bone, they deposit new bone. Osteoclasts collapse the bone, they break it down. When I say collapse, because collapse begins with a C, osteoclasts with a C, and so osteoblasts with a B that build up. Do you see the difference there? Yes. Okay, good. That's a hint. Now, when that bone gets collapsed, it's going to release some of the minerals. And what do we store in our bones? Calcium. Calcium is important for muscle contraction. What that means is, the more muscle that you have in your body, the more calcium you're going to have to have stored. 
The more muscle you have in your body, the more calcium you need to store there. The more calcium you store, the stronger your bones are going to be. What that means is, if you build big muscles, you're going to have strong bones. The more muscle you build, the stronger your bones. This is why women get um, osteoporosis at such a higher rate than men do. Because women naturally have less muscle mass, and they naturally store less calcium. So their bones are naturally thinner and smaller, and they can be more easily prone to fracture. So what I tell young ladies is, uh, in your exercise regime, um, make sure to include some kind of muscle building protocol. In other words, some sort of resistance exercise to build up those muscles. That was just you. Don't fret. Listen to this. I don't teach you this. I'm teaching you this. Build bigger muscles now. Make that a part of your exercise. You don't have to get huge muscles. You don't have to be this one. That's crazy. But <laughs> that's just insane. But you do want to build up more muscle because then your body's naturally going to store more calcium. I know people will say, well, tell me, take calcium supplements. If your body doesn't need it, your body's not going to store it. It's just going to pee it right out. Calcium supplements serve are a last resort. So if you get in your elder years, you have to take calcium supplements. But before you reach those elder years, build up as much muscle as possible. It'll make a difference. Um, that's why, as I said, grandma is shrinking. Then you also see she's sort of hunched over because of the shape of the bones and shrinking. And muscle the weakness has occurred. So what can happen what could injure those muscles in your lower back that can cause that disc to slip or move? Car accident. Car accident. Very common. Sports yeah. injury? A fall, certainly. A sports injury? Sports injury, like uh, like in football or something. Yeah. Tackle hard a lot. Yeah. Well, yeah, if you lift incorrectly. If you lift incorrectly. If you lift incorrectly, yes. Because how do we lift things up the ground? How many people lift things like this? And how many people lift things like this? I go, don't do that. Because that's what causes those muscles to get strained and injured. And then, of course, there's something else that strains those lower muscles. Oh, chiropractic? No. When is she walking around like this? Oh, pregnancy. Pregnancy. Or pregnancy. Yeah. Because when she's pregnant, to try to compensate for the weight so that she does not tip over, she has to move her body like this. Tip over. That strains all those muscles right here. Which means later on, when she's 35 and 40 and 45 years old, and uh, she does pick something up, like laundry or something that's not terribly heavy, Suddenly, there's that feeling of something happened right here, and now she has that tingling, numbness sensation down her leg. And she thinks it was because she picked up some laundry. But the real injury happened years ago when she was walking around carrying babies like this. Wow. Three babies, no car. So, don't do that. Don't do it. Don't be pregnant. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's devastating in the bottom. It's just a bad idea. So is smoking. Ooh. On the top of page 34. Not the bite. Pathology. Okay. Avascular necrosis. A means without. Vascular is blood. Blood supply. So without blood supply, bone dies because it's the tissue. So if a person has a bad enough fracture where the bone is sticking out of the skin, that means it could have pulled away from its blood supply. 
So not only are we exposing bone to the outside world, which is filthy, as we know, but now we're also possibly taking blood supply away. And if that happens, now we're talking about bone death. And how long will that have to take? Six hours. Six hours. Six hours. Six hours. Six hours. Six hours. So if someone doesn't get to the hospital to correct their leg within six hours, they're, they're going to have to lose the bone or the leg? The leg. So, the bones, if the bones uh, infected the tissue around us, they I, was, I just wasn't so sure if it was like something. I mean, it would be so unlikely right. that they just cut away part of the bone. They might have to do that, but um, this is why if somebody has a broken bone, the bone sticking out of the skin, you go to the emergency room. If somebody has a broken bone because they slipped and fell and the wrist is broken, they go to the emergency room, and the emergency room might say, well, here, put a splint on it, contact this orthopedic surgeon, and they'll determine what to do with it next. But if it's sticking out of the skin, well, now we have a problem that needs to fix now. Mm -hmm. It's more immediate. Mm. All right, look at the top of the page bone tumors, osteoma, and an osteosarcoma. An osteoma is a benign tumor of the bone, an osteosarcoma is a malignant tumor of the bone. Remember, benign means it can grow, but it won't spread. So that's always better. Malignant means it will spread. That's always bad. That's cancerous. Always bad. There's a type of a bone, a type of a bone cancer called osteosarcoma that we call a human sarcoma. This is incredibly devastating because this happens in kids. I mean, you'll hear about it. Uh, 11 or 12 year old kid who will be complaining about severe pain in the leg when they come home from school and when mom and dad will think, you know, what did this kid do? Broken leg, stupid kid. Got to go to the hospital now, and then have cast put on for the next six weeks. Ruin the vacation. Um, but then when they get to the hospital, they do an x-ray of it. What they see is not a fracture. What they see is something that resembles a balloon landing. Really? And they'll take the kid from the x-ray, and they'll take him to surgery, and they'll cut off his leg. Just that fast. <laughs> this is the type of an osteosarcoma called a human sarcoma. You? It's, it's, it's very, very bad. You said you? Yeah. So you said once they look at the x-ray, they just cut it off immediately? Yeah. This is a fast, wow. malignant, cancerous tumor. Uh -huh. It's going to spread quickly and kill the kid. So so you cut off the limb. Most likely it has to be the limb. So you cut it off. And there's no marker for this. There's no there's no hereditary um, origin, there's no hereditary cause for this. Um, this is not the result of smoking or drinking or drugs or promiscuity or spitting on the sidewalk or swearing at church. This is something that just happens. And it's horrible what happens because it goes from parents thinking their idiot son did something stupid with the skateboard to now suddenly they're hoping to save the kid's life. If you go to uh, some of these children's hospitals or you go to the college department, you'll see lots of kids walking around with one arm or one leg. Oh and God. you'll find out that a lot of them had something like this or had to be amputated quickly. So it's pretty devastating. I'm going to like and that's all the kids, they have to leave, they have to leave. Mm -hmm. It's a little crying every day. Yeah, I don't know how they do it. I don't know how those people do it. She's just standing there, they're just going to challenge you. We're going to cry. We might warn them. I don't like kids, but I don't want to see them get hurt. Um, and I wouldn't be able to work something like that. That would be terrible. So, anyway. Um, Look at right. look up uh, your insert camera if you get a chance. You need to see this. It's pretty I interesting. E W I N G. Do it. Do the E W. In English. E W I N G. New insert camera. E W I N G. E wing. How about that? Okay. Okay. So <laughs> camera. You still got the circle? Yeah. Yeah. Here's a hint, actually. When you're looking at an oma versus a sarcoma, 
If you see an ulmer versus a sarcoma, the ulmer is usually the benign one, the sarcoma is usually the malignant one. So if there's a test question that says something about a blah, 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 malignant tumor, and it goes down like ulmer, sarcoma, ulmer, sarcoma, ulmer, sarcoma, you can kind of rule out the ulmers. It's more likely the sarcomas. Because those are more likely than malignant. But it's ulmer, it's usually benign. Malignant. Malignant. So the sarcoma, not ulmer? The ulmer is usually the benign one. The sarcoma is usually the malignant. When you're comparing them, like this osteoma versus an osteosarcoma. Or this chondroma. A chondroma, a chondroma is a benign tumor of the cartilage. So what would a malignant tumor of the cartilage be? <coughs> Sorry, chondrosarcoma. Chondrosarcoma. It would be the malignant version. <laughs> Have you heard of fractures before? Yeah. Yes. Um, there's two main types. Stress fracture and pathologic fracture. Stress fracture is kind of what you think of when you think of something breaks a bone. They got hit by a car, they fell out of a tree, they got shot. Broken bone. And that's a stress fracture. Pathologic fracture is a fracture caused from a disease process, like cancer. The bone gets so weak it breaks. And it, doesn't, it could be a malignant cancer that spreads to the bone. Or, um, osteos or uh, osteoporosis. The bone is really, really thin and brittle and just breaks. Wait, so... It's a pathologic fracture versus a stress fracture. Pathologic is caused by a disease? Yep. That's the name. And what's the other fracture? Stress. Stress fracture. This is what we call a displaced fracture. It's not an alignment. So what do we have to do? Well, can you push back? Put it back in alignment. Makes sense. See that space right there between this bone and this bone? We have to reduce that space. See the spaces like this? We have to reduce that space. So you'll hear the doctors say they're going to reduce a fracture. That's what they mean. They're reducing that space. They're putting them in alignment. And then once we put bones in alignment, then what do we do? Put a spike here. To make sure that alignment. Well, what about something a little strong in this point? A cast. Cast. So what's the purpose of a cast? To hold everything in place. So the process can be That's it. There's no medicinal purpose to a cast. All it's doing is it's holding these parts in place. Then what's going to happen is this right here is going to fill up with that cartilage we saw before. And then that is going to turn into bone ossification, which could take a couple of weeks. Now, okay, going back to what you were saying about. And then what we have now. solid bones. Although there might be a little scar tissue right there. So you might see it on an x-ray, you can see it on a skeleton, you can see where there are previous fractures that had healed. But hopefully it'll be as strong as it was before. That's going to be based on things like the person's age, the person's overall health, how bad the fracture was. What was your question? Is that as far as ossification, you just explain that in older people. Now, is that because you said it doesn't allow the process to to complete itself, that's why um, that's why for the most part like they get shorter. Mm -hmm. Ossification is just the placement of the cartilage with new bone. Mm -hmm. So it happens to us when we're children. Yeah. We have a lot of cartilage that's going to turn into new bone. 
And then when we have a repair, it's going to create that same sort of car that's going to turn into new bone. But as people get older, just overall, bone starts to get broken down and not replaced as much as it did okay. through our youth. Okay. So that's what causes the bones to get thinner and smaller and more broken. Do they have the lack of calcium? One of the causes is lack of calcium. Another cause is just because of age. Okay. It's going to happen no matter how much muscle mass you have, no matter how much muscle mass I have, my bones are still going to lose mass okay. as I get older. But the idea is that if I keep as much calcium in there as possible, keep them as strong as possible, then that's going to be minimal okay. as compared to somebody who doesn't have the same calcium storage. So, of course, the non displaced fracture is just that, it just needs to be. A closed fracture means the bone doesn't break through the skin, an open fracture means that it does. And we just call that a, a compound fracture, which is what they call it open fracture. You can see some of the images up here. A transverse fracture. Something's like that. An oblique fracture. Happens at an angle. And a spiral fracture. Really? Bone will twist. Like oh, this. I was going to say outside. So imagine um, a guy working on a piece of machinery that's spinning. And his sleeve gets caught in it, Ooh. and it twists like this, and just cause the bone to twist. Now, I know you might say, well, could, wouldn't it cut, pull it out of the socket? Yeah, it could do that as well. Could it hurt the arm right off? Well, yeah, it could do that as well. But one of the things you'll see is the bone twist. Um, I heard of a young lady who was swinging off of a rope into a river. You know, they pull onto the rope yeah, and they jump off the river. Now. She let go of the rope, and the rope caught her on her wrist, so the whole weight of her body just twisted around that way. It causes spiral fracture. Makes sense. A uh, foosh injury. Foosh stands for falling on an outstretched hand. Uh, you know, you're running, you trip, yeah. you fall, oh, you my catch yourself. Sister. My best friend, she was playing and she was, you know, she went like this, but her boyfriend, like, like sat on her arm by accident. Like that whole part, this is like, I don't know what. what Wait, you what sound are you making? Nope. Okay, all right, yeah, now I recognize that. Yeah, you're right. We call that a yeah. fracture, yeah. Oh, okay. It's terrible. Yeah, terrible. Mm -hmm. yeah, terrible. <laughs> well, this is more about falling on your own weight, not assisting with anybody else. Like, you're trying to break your fall. Trying to break your fall. <laughs> and. Uh, the most common one is called a Cooley's fracture. Everybody in here knows somebody who's had this out here. Um, and it's a, it's a fracture of the distal ra radius from the lower thumb side. Mm -hmm. Distal radius fracture. This is the most common type of Fouch injury. Um, it'll cause what we call a, a bent fork deformity. So the wrist will sort of look like, it'll come up like this, like a fork. Mm -hmm. Like that. And you'll see the person, they'll walk in the emergency room with their hand like this. And you ask them what happened, and they'll say, well, I was running with my dogs. And you don't even have to finish the story. You already know what happened. Mm -hmm. They tripped, they fell, they tried to catch themselves. Uh, another one, when they hit, pressure goes on this side, and it causes the ulna to sort of bend, and it causes the, a fracture near the proximal end of the ulna. It's called a Montagia fracture. And that often displaces the radius, pushes the radius out of its place. There's like three different Montagia fractures out of the number what they are, that's for the orthopedics to know, uh, depending upon how much the radius is displaced. But you can also see the same sort of fracture as a defensive wound. Somebody's coming at you with a bat, like Negan's coming at you with a bat, and it goes down like this, and you put your arm up to try to deflect it, it's right here, like right that. So it's similar to that type of fracture. Okay. Um, you can see some of these other ones here. You know, if we went outside, out back, after you break a window, we crawl out the window. If you go, we go out back, and then pick up a stick off the ground that's about this big around, and that stick's been on the ground for like three years, and you grab the stick and you put it across your knee and you pull, what's going to happen? It's going to snap in half, right? What if you went over to one of the trees, and you found a branch that was the same size, still had leaves on it, nice green leaves, and you saw that branch off, and then you take that branch to bring it over your leg and try to 
Well, what's going to happen? It's going to break. You said saw it off. Yeah, just saw it off the tree. It was still on the tree. Oh, okay, okay. But then yeah, you try to take it like this, and you go like this. It's going to work. It's sort of going to bend like this. Maybe. But it's never going to break. And then kind of like uh, fracture up like this. It's not going to snap in half. It's sort of going to bend and bend oh, and bend okay. and then just sort of splinter like this. Mm -hmm. And the reason that happened is because there's still a lot of moisture in that branch because it's still living. A lot of moisture. Nice green leaves on there. So we call that a, um, a green stick fracture because we see this in children. When there's young kids with those bones that still have a lot of cartilage in them, those bones don't just necessarily snap in half. They sort of bend like this and kind of go back into a position to where it's almost the same. And you can kind of see it here. You can see where it's sort of flexed and it kind of went back. We call it a green stick fracture because just like taking a nice green healthy stick off of a tree, it's not going to just snap in half. It sort of flexes first and then kind of splinters a little bit and then goes mostly back into position. As you can imagine, we expect that to heal pretty well, right? Yes. Because kids are still growing, so there's a lot of new bone that's going to happen. So as long as it's in the right position, it should grow back just fine. Um, hopefully. Instead. One of the fractures I have here, a hairline fracture. Just like it sounds like a hairline fracture is like a crack. Like this. Again, depending on the health of the patient. You see this a lot in the ribs. People get tackled with footballs, hit hard, ribs crack, but not necessarily breaking a lot of pieces. There's a little crack in it. All you do is take that whole area up to sort of support it. And what's that called? Hairline crack. Oh, that's awesome. You see it at the gym also. You know, people pick up a 45 pound weight, the plates, the big ones, taking them from here over there, and they go to put them up on top of the little weight rack and it slips off under their toes, oh. under their met metatarsals. Um, think of somebody coming over hitting this guy in the head with a hammer. Now, obviously, what are we going to be most concerned about? Your brain. Exactly. Not my brain, the guy's brain. Not mine, because I'm not getting hit. <laughs> but you hit this with a hammer, what's going to happen is there's going to be a piece of the skull that's going to break in a hammer shape and get pushed down into the cranium. That's why it's called a depression fracture, it gets depressed. That's different from a compression fracture. A compression fracture is when you get that drunk dancing on top of the bar, and they fall and they land on their butt. So the floor stops their fall, but the rest of their body weight is still coming down, and it finds the weakest vertebra and just goes and compresses it. That's a compression fracture. Now, why would we be worried about something like that? Because well, your spinal cord. Exactly. Because remember, the vertebrae are around the spinal cord. So we don't want to see anything mess with the spinal cord because that can mean serious problems everywhere else as far as nerve injury, as far as paralysis. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll take a break. Um, and kids we call rickets. Osteomyelitis is inflammation, usually due to infection of the bone of the bone marrow. So what kind of doctors work with bones? Uh, living bones. Uh, orthopedics, oh, orthopedic know. surgeons, for instance. Oh, yeah, ortho. Yeah. Those are the people who are cutting into bone and fixing fractures, doing things like that. So if they're cut or they're doing knee replacements, if they're doing that kind of surgery, that means they're exposing living bone tissue to the air, which means it increases the likelihood of infection. Yes. That's why the orthopedic surgeons go into surgery wearing that whole hood over their head rather than just a mask and a skull cap. And they wear long booties, long sleeves up their gowns because they don't want to infect their patients. 
Yes. Especially that bone area. Question mark. So osteomyelitis inflammation due to infection of the bone and bone marrow usually due to infection. Osteomyelitis. It can also be caused by things like um, diabetes. Diabetes decreases the flow of blood to areas, increases the likelihood of infection. You end up with patients who have blackened toes. What do we do to the toe? Cut it off. Cut it off. But how far up do they amputate? As far as the infection? As far as, far as the necrosis goes, which means that you don't take an x-ray first, because there might be necrosis in the metatarsals that you just can't see yet. So if all you do is cut off a digit, the metatarsals, those longer bones, can still be um, dead, and that means they're going to be infected, and you wouldn't even know it. So you have to take an x-ray to see how much um, dead tissue there is, and then cut that off. So diabetes is... You said it uh, slows up the blood flow? Yeah, decreases blood flow to areas. Um, what do we see? In patients with um, diabetes, <coughs> increased staph infections, staphylococcus aureus infections in their bones and joints. Is that both types of diabetes? Yeah. Yeah, that's when it gets always untreated or uh, not treated well, treated poorly. Osteoporosis, bone breakdown exceeds bone formation, causing a weak stain of bone. The bone has been demineralized, it's lost all that calcium. So, of course, who do we see these patients? I've described the patient that had osteoporosis. Elderly. Elderly. And male or female? Female. Most likely female, yes. More female than male. Um, kyphosis, lordosis, and scoliosis are abnormal curvatures of the vertebral column. <laughs> Okay, you can see her normal presentation normally. The vertebral call has a nice, sort of gentle double S curve to it. Kyphosis, we see this hunchback or humpback. Lordosis, we see this anterior curvature, which creates what we call a swayback. And then scoliosis is a side to side curvature. Now, the reality is. Every single one of us has some of this to some degree. Uh, the reason why we don't have this perfectly nice double S shape to our vertebral column is because we're human beings. And remember, that shape is really dependent on things like the, the shape of the bone, the thickness of the bone, the way those discs are, the ligaments, the muscle with the tendons attached to them. All of those things are going to have an effect on that nice vertebral column plus our genetics. So even if yours is perfect like this right now, it won't be in the future. In the future, it's going to change a little bit, if it, it hasn't already. Most of us already have a little bit of one of these or a little bit of two of these. I'm sorry, I definitely have some lordosis down on I'm sorry? I was going to say, I definitely have some lordosis down on Well, the more severe this is, the more devastating it is. The lordosis especially because, I'm sorry, the the uh, scoliosis especially because it interferes with the um, spinal cord much more. But uh, we're human beings, so all of us are going to have a little bit of irregularity to us. And we'll go through our life not knowing or not caring, not making a difference. But if we went to a chiropractor and asked the chiropractor to check our back, he would tell us that we're out of alignment. Because we all are. We're all a little bit out of alignment. So yeah, we expect that to happen. But doing this is not going to put that back because it's you know contingent on all those other things. Yeah, I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Wait, what? What's that? 
you would, you would rather have? No, I said my little cousin. Oh, did. I was going to say, you can't choose. What's the one at the end? Scoliosis. 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 Yeah, side and side. She can't still wear, like, a brace. Yeah, because yeah. if it's not severe, I could look I could look just like this. Staying here looks just like this. You wouldn't even know the difference. I could have a little bit of scoliosis right now. You wouldn't know the difference. The more severe it is, the more shifting you'll see in the shoulders, right? It'll be more and more like this. But the problem is we don't want that to happen because that can interfere with that spinal cord or anything. So we want to maintain the straight. So if they're young and it's a little bit, you can put that brace on the outside and that'll help everything grow straight. So if it's really severe, they can insert rods and make sure yeah, they're very straight. Like that. <clears throat> yeah. So with the brace, how long? I have no idea. It depends on the brace. Yeah. Oh. How old? She just turned 14. Yeah. I think they, she was diagnosed in, I, I want to say like a year or a year and a half ago. Yeah, it depends on the severity. And she's like because, really small. Because the reality is, <coughs> eventually she's going to stop growing, right? Uh -huh. And when she stops growing, it doesn't make a difference if you put a brace on or don't put a brace on. Um, because it's not going to really change anything. Right. If you want to change something, then you have to break something and then put it in alignment and then put the brace on alignment. So consider most people are going to stop growing by the time they're in their 18th year. She probably have to wear it until she's in her 18th or 19th year, is what I would think. But again, that just depends on the severity of it. Well, we talked about this top of page 35. We've got the, the notes in front of you. Remember, not necessary to discuss this course and the opportunities. We talked about a herniated disc, the bulging disc. That's this disc right here. And you see the bulging of the nucleus pulposus right here. We talked about how that happens. Arthralgia, what does algae mean? Pain. 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 What does arthro mean? Joints. Joint. So what's the definition for arthralgia? Joint pain. Pain in the joints. Yes. Okay. Yikes. So you have a patient, comes in the office, says, Doc, I don't know what I did to my foot, but it is really swollen and hurting. Mm -hmm. And you ask the patient what they did, and they said, well, last night I went out for a steak dinner, and I had some steak and mashed potatoes and gravy. And then I went to my friend's wine and cheese party and drank a lot of good red wine, had some nice French cheese, ate a lot of cheese, drank a lot of red wine. And then I did some dancing, because that's what you do after you drink wine and eat cheese. Woke up this morning, my big toe looked like this. He thinks it's because he injured it dancing, or because his shoes were too tight that there was a problem. But we know, after doing blood tests, that his uric acid levels are elevated. And that this is actually an accumulation of precipitated uric acid in the joints. We call this gout. The reason for this is because every one of us has a recycling center inside of our body that recycles proteins. We have two types of proteins. We have pyrimidines and purines. And our purine recycling center, when we eat foods that are high in purine, those amino acids will get into that recycling center, we'll reuse them, break them down, and reuse them. In some patients, their recycling centers are working very well. So it just sort of spits them out. And it causes this increase in this uric acid in the blood. And then it precipitates in the joints. In other words, forms crystals in the joints. Obviously, that would be like having sharp little crystals of sand inside and between your joints. That's going to cause a lot of pain. Yeah. And of course, that's going to cause an inflammation, which is going to be followed by what? Edema. Edema, swelling, which is also going to include your see redness there. Which is why you see this big swollen area here. So for these patients, we're going to have to tell them you got to cut down on your proteins. You can't take in that much protein all at once. And we'll give a little brochure that lists all the foods that have higher proteins than others. But this can happen in any joint. Oh my. So it can happen in the neck. Can happen in the neck? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Neck have bones? 
mean, your spine. Does the neck have bones? Mm -hmm. yeah. What are those bones called? The spine. They're vertebrae. Vertebrae. And when a bone meets a bone, is that called a joint? <clears throat> Correct. So could it happen in the neck? Yes. Yes. Sure. Could it happen in the knee? Yeah. Yeah. Could it happen in the elbow? Yes. Yep. Maybe However, the textbook, the one I want you to know about is the big toe. This is just the most common place that it shows up. This is gout. So no, that hallux. Just less well, protein. We can we can give a medication like colchicine to decrease the amount of uh, of the acid that's there. But what we're gonna ultimately do is tell them to decrease the amount of proteins that you take in all of this. And that will decrease and that will decrease this happening. Hmm. Remember the patient went to the wine and cheese party at the state. Kind of crazy. A dislocation, displacement, and a bone from sole locations out of a joint. I think we all know what a dislocation means, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. It means this humor should be up in here, but it's not. It's uh, way over here or something. So what we got to do is we got to push it back into place, which is a loud yeah, and painful process. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of things you have to realize. There's a lot of things that make your arm move like this and move this way and move this way and move this way. We have a lot of things crossing over here, a lot of muscles and tendons um, and then the ligaments that are attaching and, of course, the burst that's in here. So if it moved out of all that place, you got to maneuver it back into that place. It's amazing that you can move by just... Maneuver it back in place. It takes a little bit of muscle, but yeah. But the thing is, once that happens, now this person is more prone to that dislocating again. Yeah. 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 Right, because now everything is looser. Think of it that way, right? Um, that's different from a subluxation, which is like a partial dislocation. It's not a complete dislocation, it's like a partial dislocation. So, needless to say, it's going to be easier to put back into place. A lot, a lot of that happens with those. <coughs> Where? No loops. And loops. Hmm. Question? One of the things I see is because they put like, that little, that little uh, thing, the right punch thing, or do they put gas on it? If anything, it'll be a sling to transport, and uh, then to keep it stable um, while it heals. Don't need a cast for it. Yes. Do this location that it caused by surgery? Most of the time, no. But obviously, something can be dislocated quite a bit out of the way to where we have um, a separation. Mm -hmm. we talk about this chapter? What? No, we talk about it much. Um, we will actually have. Part of the muscle tear away from the tendon, or the tendon tear away from the bone, and oftentimes it'll even pull like a piece of bone with it. So you have the muscle attached to the tendon, the tendon still attached to the chip of the bone, and now that part of the bone has to be reattached to the bone, which usually requires like a screw, uh, and then of course that can take a while to heal. That's uh, what we call a bulging, and again we'll talk about that later. But that could cause that could be an injury that could change a career. Yeah. Uh, and I have another question. It it kind of slipped my mind. What we were talking about herniated discs, <coughs> and You said down you know, here. Lumbar vertebrae are the most common. So have you ever heard it be up here? In the neck all the time. Oh. Okay. Especially automobile accidents. Yeah. All over that. Now. And then, when that happens, in the neck. It often involves more than one, so that when uh, they choose to do a spinal fusion or put a cage on, it often involves several of vertebrae fused together. Uh, I have it. How? Upright. That's why you wear your seatbelt. I have. And that's and that's why you adjust your seat correctly, so your headrest is right here, because the headrest is not for resting your head. They should call it a Head stop, because that's what it head does. Guard. So when you get into an accident and you 
fall forward like this, you only go so forward as the seatbelt keeps you in place, and you go backwards, that stops your head from snapping backwards. People don't always do that. People don't always adjust their seats correctly and have their seatbelt on correctly. So I guess my question is, it don't go away unless you get surgery. Well, something's been injured, right? Which means probably things like muscles attached to the tendons of the injury. So what we want to do is we want to strengthen those muscles, which means physical therapy. And usually physical therapy is something the patient does just until the settlement happens. Um, and then when they find out that now they have to pay for their own physical therapy, they stop doing it. Or they just stop doing it. They're told at home that they're supposed to, they just don't. So then later on down the road, 10, 15, 20 years later, then they find themselves in a position where they have to have all these things screwed together because the headaches are going to be constant. And then once they have several of those screws together, the patient will say, this is all I can do in my head now. And this is this, and this to this, and that's it. They won't be able to move their head more than this. Because they can stuck together. So I'll have that happen. What happens when people get clicks in their name? Oh, I want to get shot. So when they do an epidural, it goes like in the spine, right? It's not an epidural. Not it's a the spine. Uh, spine. Because I've had, um, if someone had bulging discs and scoliosis, would well, they still be able to get it? It depends. That would be up for the, that would be up for the anesthesiologist to determine. It depends on where it's located and what the reason for the epidural is. Because of course, sometimes, you know, doing an epidural, if there's more risk involved than necessary, they won't do it. Mm -hmm. It's just a block pain. So, you know, she's pregnant. Uh, she might have to go around that door. She might have to be candidate for it. Just like women okay. have been doing it for a long time now, like millions of years. Okay. And the crook in the neck is usually muscle tightness. Uh, hemarthrosis, blood in the joint. You see that when uh, a young boy is running down the sidewalk, running down across the yard trips. Ball bumps his knee, and there's a little bit of bleeding that starts in the joint, not on the outside, you can't see it. But the bleeding continues and continues and continues. His knee swells up to the size of a grapefruit. Um, this is one of the indications that sometimes we see a patient who has hemophilia, bleeding disorder. That's so like uh, one of the first things that's kind of see. Arthritis. Do I even have to tell you what arthritis is now? Oh, it's no. getting old. Arthritis, inflammation of the joint. Oh, too. Thank you. <coughs> so osteoarthritis, inflammation of the bone and joint. Also known as degenerative joint disease. Um, cartilage is getting worn away. So the cartilage in that like tibia and femur are wearing through that meniscus. And then start wearing through the articular cartilage on the ends of the bones, and eventually it would be bone on bone. You could hear that. That's painful. It's called crepitus. So you could hear that grinding sound. You could hear it. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, those patients are the ones who are going to have to get a, a knee transmitted on the Knee replacement. Tibia off, come part of the full. Drill down into the tibia. And then hammer that piece in place. Man, you can hear that down the hall as they're chiseling away bone, pounding into place in the bone to get that knee replaced. Oh, but like the screws and like the weights. Is that how they get Screws Why heavy weight? Why heavy weights? Why what? Heavy weight patients. Because all the weight from the person's body comes down to these two points. So there's a lot of motion. So people who are overweight for a long period of time in their lives, putting all that extra weight on those joints, just causes them to wear away. It's not good. Or you see that in long distance runners too, people run marathons, putting all that extra pressure on those joints for a long period of time. That's why I'm not a big fan of the treadmill. I'd rather see people on like an elliptical machine where they don't have that jarring impact. Or a best case scenario, a swimming pool. Because swimming laps and swimming pools are much better exercise. Good for resistance and for aerobic. So is this um, 
I don't think it's normal, but like sometimes when I um doesn't sort of put them out the images. But sometimes like when I stretch, like in here, I got like a Oh, it's just a Picasso kind of joint. It's fine. It'll be okay. I hear that a lot. Or it's cancer kind of too. Yeah. So. <laughs> when I'm like, oh, I'm yeah. Patty LaBelle. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is the other type of arthritis here. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. Remember, autoimmune disease means the body's making a mistake. It's destroying something it thinks should not be there, but actually should. So in this case, it's attacking the cartilage and the connective tissue around it. That's not good. <coughs> so what can we do? Well, not much. Um, if somebody has rheumatoid arthritis, one of the options is to give something to stop the immune system from fighting off all that tissue, destroying all that tissue. So we give them medications called DMAR, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. And you'll notice I have them listed here as like cyclosporine and azithiocrine, um, the gold salts, uh, 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 depenicillin. Um, notice... Methotrexate. Did I say methotrexate? No, you, you started from the back. Sorry. <laughs> um, notice with these, they are in italicies. So what does that mean for you? It's important. Remember. No, just no. the opposite. Uh, if something's in italicies in the notes like this, um, like whole sentences, that usually means don't worry about it. Um, uh, this is FYI. It's more for paramedic students. You don't really need to know that. You'll come across these things, and somewhere down the line, you'll see methotrexate being used to treat something else. And you'll say, but I thought that was a drug for... Uh, maybe methotrexate used to treat I've definitely heard of it. lupus, and you'll say, but I thought that was a drug for treating arthritis. Well, realize it's a disease for treating stuff in the immune system, so it's used a lot for different autoimmune diseases. So you'll see this some of these drugs a lot. It's like the as well, is a bad thing. So, uh, with, all right. So a patient that that all right, lupus and all right. Do they have similar symptoms in some way? Uh, I would say the similarities come with pain in the joints, oh, okay. things like that. Yeah. Because for a lot of my sister, she thought she had RA, but come to find out she had lupus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So things like that, but um, for different reasons. But I mean that should make sense to you, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody in here has had cramps in their abdomen before. Mm -hmm. Well, just because I have cramps in my abdomen doesn't mean I'm pregnant. It doesn't mean that um, I'm in the ischemic phase of my menstrual cycle and I'm about to start my menses. Uh, it can also just be gas, right? So, or it could be a cancer. That put that in there somewhere. So, with some things, yeah, they're going to have very similar signs and symptoms, especially when we're talking about autoimmune disease. <coughs> now, here's an interesting one Lyme disease. Yeah, super interesting. Oh, okay, we're good. Lyme disease. You've heard of this, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. How do you get Lyme disease? Ticks. Everybody says from tick. Actually, it's a bacterial infection. So how are we going to treat it? With uh, antibiotics. Antibiotics. Wait. Antibiotics. That's how you treat it. Hold on. I know you're going to ask. Hold on. I know you're going to ask. Lyme disease is transferred by the tick in the saliva of the tick. So the bacteria is there in the saliva of the tick. So when the tick goes to get a blood meal, and then the bacteria is transferred from the tick to the human, or to the other one first. That bacteria then causes an infection, obviously, but we can treat that infection with oxycycline. We treat the infection with antibiotic. No problem. Then why is it listed here? In the bone and joint section of the nose. Because doesn't it stick around? Joint because I know you're going to think because it sticks around that's always in your body. That's not true. Because I knew you were going to ask that. Because that's what everybody that's what everybody thinks. That if it's in you, it's in you forever. No, that's not true. Um, because it's a bacterial infection. We get rid of bacteria pretty easily with antibiotics. 
Don't worry. The problem is our body creates antibodies against this bacteria. The antibodies that our body creates and will continue to create throughout life are the problem. The antibodies is what goes on to destroy tissue around the joints. The antibodies go and cause the problems with the heart, even sometimes with the brain. Because the bacteria is gone, but the antibodies are still there. That's what creates the problem. Yes? I'm just still kind of confused. Um, so I do, I do have a family member that has Lyme disease. That's why like, I'm, I've heard of it before. But um, I, thought, I thought that she, that this was something that she lived with like, on a daily basis because she would talk about it like she still had it and stuff like that. Yes. She, she does live in the woods, so there's like ticks and deer and all that stuff. So I'm asking, like, yeah. can she keep getting reinfected? Oh, sure. Or, or, but that's not the problem. And then my next confusion is, how are the antibodies attacking the joints and cartilage when... What does the immune system do? It fights off the disease. Fights off no, not the disease. Infection. No. The immune system fights off things that don't belong. Okay. Like cancer cells. Cancer cells are not infectious agents. Cancer cells are our own cells that have gone wrong. The immune system fights those off. The immune system fights off things that don't belong. <laughs> the problem is sometimes the immune system makes a mistake. And when the immune system makes a mistake, that means the immune system, meaning antibodies and such, are fighting off things that do belong. So, the problem is, when a person is affected with this bacterium, the body says, let's destroy this and make antibodies so we don't have to worry about destroying it again. When it comes in next time, we'll attack it quickly and destroy it. So it makes the antibodies. And the bacteria eventually are gone. Like we do a bunch of antibiotics, for instance, bacteria is gone. However, the antibodies are still there, and the body's going to continue to make them. Those antibodies make a mistake. And they say, oh, there's more of that bad stuff we got to get rid of it. But it's not bad stuff. It's stuff we're supposed to have. So the antibodies are now attacking things that we're supposed to have in our body, and it's destroying them or causing them to be destroyed. And that's like the thing only happens with Lyme disease, where the antibiotics... That's any... That's rheumatoid arthritis. That's lupus. That's any... That's um, vitiligo. Remember vitiligo? Yeah. Attacked melanocytes, destroyed yeah. them incorrectly. When the immune system makes a mistake and destroys something that's supposed to be there, you oh, call so that really any autoimmune. autoimmune disease um, can have any antibodies that do that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we see that with strep throat. People get strep throat and it causes that whitish stuff to get coughed or yellowish stuff. They cough up and they have a sore throat and they have a fever. We give them antibodies and get rid of the strep throat. But then a month later, suddenly there are problems with their urination. Why the problems with the urination? Well, the body created antibodies to fight off the bacteria, but the bacteria are now gone. But those antibodies are still circulating, and they actually interfere with the kidney function. It's called acute glomerular nephritis, which we'll see. Does that ha on. happen often with strep, or is that... It happens often enough that if a person comes in the emergency room and says, I don't know what's wrong, I'm having a problem urinating, it's not happening right, maybe there's a little blood in it, who they knows? Ask, have you had uh, the very first thing in emergency room doctors are going to ask them is, have you had strep throat in the past month? It happens often enough for it to be the first question. Mm -hmm. Wait, just a second. Did that answer your question about Lyme disease? Because the bacteria is gone, the body yeah, is creating... Yeah, it makes sense because it's an autoimmune disease. Right, so. and of course the body is going to continue to make those things, which is why the person is why I have to live with this forever so, now. Lyme it disease, doesn't mean the bacteria is still there. Gotcha. So Lyme disease is not, a, it's not more, it's more so about the effect of the bacteria than the bacteria. Like it's the, more about the body's trying, it's more about the body's effect trying to fight off the bacteria yeah. than the bacteria themselves. Because okay. we can wipe out bacteria easily. Gotcha. That's what antibiotics do. This is just Borrelia burgdorferi, one little bacteria. So we can get rid of him. But the body has now created something that was trying to destroy the bacteria, but is inadvertently destroying other things. 
Right. That's why the people say, well, I have to live with it forever. Bacteria's not there, but they don't understand. So, that. could Because that they've be... never had a doctor sit down and explain the immune system to them and how that works. So, could that be um, my family member with the that has had Lyme disease? Could that be why, like, when she's sitting, she rubs her knees like this? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I just never made that correlation, I guess. And again, a lot of people don't understand this. So that's how they describe it. Yes. Okay. I'll be here. Uh, why do they call it Lyme disease? Don't even say because it's green. I swear to God. You say it's green. Just get out now. Don't even bother with you. Because first of all, Lyme, the fruit is spelled L-I-M-E, not the Y. Is it has something to do with the tick? Or the no. disease itself? No. Why is it Lyme? It was first discovered in Lyme, Connecticut. Oh, uh, interesting. And actually, there's two. There's new Lyme and old Lyme in Connecticut. But, um, Lyme. They just call it Lyme. Because yeah. that's where they first discovered it, because that's where a lot of the outbreaks were happening. Not only that, but there were a lot of outbreaks happening there. There were a lot of kids getting sick with this. Not only was there a lot of kids getting sick with this, but the doctors didn't know what was causing it. They're playing outside. So, there needed to be more research. So, they needed more research? They needed more research, which means they needed more money. And who lives in Lyme, Connecticut? Probably nobody. Wealthy people. Exactly. Really? So, when the kids of wealthy people start getting sick, they're going to pay the doctors say, we don't know what's causing it. We, we need more research. What are they going to do? Fund it. Tell them. They're going to write a check. Yep. They're going to say, who do I make the check out to? This is why it's very important. You need to write this down. It's very, very important to be wealthy. Write that down and underline it. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, just, it's like a tonight going to solar tower plant. I was using it to fix the state. Uh, sorry. Fidgeting. <laughs> now it's like a fidget spinner. Um, the rest of this stuff, just listen. Tearing your arm, stretching a ligament with a sprain. This this gets to be a pain uh, because people often ask me, well, they, they said, the doctor said I, I tore a ligament. How long until it heals? How long until I can play basketball again? And I say, I don't know. And then they say, but you're a doctor, you should know. Well, the problem is this is a tear. I can fix this with some spit. Look at that, good as new. This is also a tear. This is going to need some tape, but I can fix this. This is also a tear. And this is going to require lots, lots, lots of tape and some staples. So when somebody says to me, I tore a ligament, what if I play basketball? I say, I have no idea. I don't know what that means. You tore it. I don't know how much of a tear there is. I don't know. You know and of course, obviously, it would depend on their overall health and age as well. So just turn it over and leave the uh, Pectus excavatum, the xiphoid process, this right here is bent inward too far. It's angled inward right here. Ouch. Person takes their shirt off. Oh, I'm with some name, I think. And there's like a, a, an indent. The person takes their shirt off and there's a big divot indentation right here. It looks like maybe they were shot and never healed right or something. It's just the way this was bent. And it's a very easy fix. If you get to a kid like this who's 10 years old, you get, all you got to do is put a little bridge, a little plastic bridge, surgically insert it underneath there and it'll straighten it out. It's very, very easy. It's mostly cosmetic. Most of the time, it doesn't cause any kind of problems with breathing or anything like that. All right, Gino Verum and Gino Valgum. This is important to realize because when we talk about bow leggedness, it's not because of the bent bones. That is because of osteomalacia or rickets. <laughs> Did Here's the normal. Look at the pelvis right here. 
You see how the femur comes this angle and then comes in this way? That's normal. So your femur is not straight like this. Your femur is actually out here and comes in this way. That's normal. That's what creates the straight leg. The angle that the femur comes starts here. If you look at the bow-legged person, look at the angle that comes out of the pelvis. Like a and straight down. Out. It's already straight, period. No. The problem is here. It comes out at like a 90 It comes out at, yeah, at a more straight angle. So that causes the bone to come straight down. Well, now, if you have to get your balance beneath you, your feet are going to go this way, inward. That's what creates that bowed look. So the bone is still just as straight as this person's, but it's all about right here at the pelvis, the angle that this comes out. Same thing here, it's coming out at too great of an angle. So now the femur comes in way too far. Which means now to get your balance, the, knee, the legs are automatically going to spread apart more, which creates that knock knee effect. So I want you to realize that bow legged people are not bow legged most of the time because their legs are bent. Most of the time it's because of this angle right here. And carrying your baby on your hip does not do this. Carrying a baby on your hip does not cause the baby to be bow leg. All babies are bow legged. Yeah. And then they grow straight this way. That's just the way God wanted it. Um, I'm the wrong person to ask. I didn't design any of this. Okay, buddy. Thank you, friend.